Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Day Dream Nation, and I've got Martin Popoff back in the seat. How are you, Martin? Yes, doing okay, doing okay. Late night over there, or super early morning over here, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. We're going to do a show about bands that have cross-genre audiences, so metalheads might like them, punk might like them, pop fans may like them. It's just basically our favourite bands that are just adored by multiple cross-genre audiences. We're going to pick five, just take it in turn. So I'll throw to you, Martin. What's your first pick? Yeah, so it's interesting. I've, I've, I've got my five here and some of them are maybe lacking in one of those departments uh, and, and not so much in others. You know, this being loved by multiple audiences. Some of these bands are kind of small and they're not loved by too many people at all, but they're definitely cross genre. That's the main yes. thing, right? Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting when you think of them in the light of that extra, you know, uh, qualifier on your question. This first one, though, um, fit, fits, fits everything to a T. Um, so I'm starting off with the Stooges. Okay. So this represents, um, that, that interesting nexus where, um, the Stooges are claimed by the history of heavy metal and they're also claimed by the history of punk. Right. Um, and it, it's interesting that it also, you know, immediately you include the likes of MC5 and the New York Dolls as well. But the Stooges are perfect for this because, uh, even though, you know, you might find some some punkiness to what's going on here. I mean, you look at the guys here they're They look like they're they're right in between punk and metal sort of thing. Of course, this is this is 1969. So the, so so neither really exist at this point. But the fact of the matter is um, for 1969, this is actually a pretty well recorded album and it's complicated enough. I mean, it's there are riffs on it. Um, yet, yet punk wants to claim the Stooges as the godfathers of punk sort of thing. And I've always included them in, in the history of heavy metal as well, because it is heavy enough to be a heavy metal album for 69. And, um, and it, and it almost feels like that's, that's a clearer path because punk is this pretty obscure thing mixed in with, uh, you know, fashion and art and philosophy and stuff that doesn't start really until about 1976 and heavy metals really quite defined by the year after this 1970 um so yeah i'll, I'll as a as a militant metalhead and a lover of punk but as a mil militant metalhead um i always like to try to reclaim the stooges for the history of heavy metal so there you go that's my first choice no that's a that's a great choice and that album is, is just it sounds so alive even in 2023 it doesn't it doesn't sound dated in any shape or form. And the production is just really speak. Oh, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great pick. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pick Motorhead. So when I was workshopping this idea with you, Martin, that was one of the bands that um, ca first came to mind because, yeah, there's a bit of a blur with Motorhead because the punks love them, the headbangers love them. I think they've got the attitude, they've got the lyrical content whether it's the, the you know they've got a faster drum beat it's uh, it's kind of a little bit of speed metal they've got guitar solos it's kind of bluesy it blurs across the genres so i'm talking more primarily with this lineup i think the uh the early uh fast eddie clark filthy animal taylor and lemmy lineup is the one which was more in the punk wheelhouse than you know here's the no sleep to Hammersmith, than the later era of uh, Lemmy, Phil Campbell and Mickey D, which was much more metal. I think that they actually sort of uh, killed by death. That actual song was when they became much more traditionally metal and I think they left a lot of their punk roots. But just going out when I was a young lad, I was 18, and a lot of the, uh, the punk you know, friends that loved all that hardcore, they loved Motorhead and especially that early Motorhead, um, that early lineup. But I think about, you know, the mid 80s onwards, um, not so much. But, you know, like they were a band that on one moment they could uh, um, record with girls' school, fraternize with them, and then they could record with the damned and be welcomed with open arms. So I think that's a perfect example of a band that uh, stylistically, uh, lyrically, and sonically, they sort of were a blur of between the, the two genres. 
Yeah. And an interesting one where, um, you know, they're one of the, you, you'd have to say they're one of the building blocks of hardcore, be that UK hardcore, American hardcore or OI or whatever. I mean, because, uh, you know, essentially when you start getting, yeah, you know, I always think of UK subs as being, being one of the, one of the key ones in 1979 there, but, uh, yeah. And motorhead, you don't really read a lot in the press of, of punkers actually liking motorhead. We almost, we almost sort of assume it existed a, a little bit and it, and it comes from Lemmy's interviews as well, but you know, with the snaggle tooth there and with the logo and stuff, you can just picture that on being on jackets on, in, on both, uh, on both sort of sides and the pins and stuff. There was a lot of more motorhead merchandise at the time as well. Right. Um, but yeah, they hung Absolutely. together and they, they, at least, you know, I, I, I suppose they, uh, they, uh, they, they, they married the, the, um, the, the tribe so that there was less fighting going on, I suppose, as well. So, Absolutely. And, um, yeah. you know, a lot of the uh, album covers from the day, like GBH, you look at the sleeve and you see the band members, they're all wearing Motorhead T-shirts. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And But if you read Lemmy, um, he was asked, are you a punk band or are you a metal band? And he just says, we're a rock and roll band. So yeah, he, yeah. he just sort of uh, simplifies <laughs> it to the, the pure es essence of what Motorhead were. Yeah, yeah. And he kept saying that through the years. And every time he'd say it, I, I'd think in the back of my head, nah, you're wrong. You know, you're a you're a metal band. You know, it's like Tony Iommi saying we're a blues band or whatever. Or, uh, <laughs> you know, Ian Gillen saying we're a jazz band. Right. Or we're a jam band or whatever. It's yeah. like, nah, you're a metal band. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, OK, so my next one. Um, I think I'm going to go with this one because it's, it's a good segue from Motorhead. Um, and this one doesn't fit the the um qualification of loved by multiple um audiences but it definitely feels like a cross genre band and, and it represents a heated debate that happens all the time gillen um so this this band represents the um the uh, are they new wave of british heavy metal or not sort of thing um and there's a few bands that do that because uh they're arriving maybe just a little too early you know, there's the Ozzy Osbourne band. It's like, you know, are you allowed to have old people in the band, but show up as a new band uh, during the new wave of British heavy metal? Are you British enough? Um, and so this is a situation where you've got guys in the band that are are sort of unknowns, um, but maybe they're young enough to be part of the band. Um, you, you know, you think of Bernie Torme, John McCoy, uh, you know, he's been around, he's been in some bands, but of course, Ian Gillen comes from the old guard, you know, the pre-punk uh, metal situation, but they're, they're operating in the new wave of British heavy metal. They're putting out picture sleeve singles all the time, colored vinyl patches, um, you know, uh, all these albums that came out on import that didn't even come out uh, in North America, some of them. Right. Um, and, uh, and they're touring with all those bands. They're, they're pretty much, they, they don't really, I mean, I think they came to America once or North America once, um, and uh, and so they're just in intrinsically hanging around in that in that metal domain. But uh, but it's one of the bands that always comes up. Do they belong? Do they not belong in the new wave of British heavy metal? Now, when it comes to audiences, um, you know, I, I guess you'd fudge that um, that maybe new wave of British heavy metal fans like younger metal heads love them, but also Deep Purple fans love them. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's a pretty harsh to me. This is the punky Deep Purple, right? Everything on here is harshly recorded, uh, harsh drums, harsh guitar sounds, ha harsh cymbals. Um, you know, Ian screaming away, pretty fast songs. Um, so yeah, they're they're the punky version of uh, of Deep Purple. But uh, yeah, there, there's another one for you. That uh, blows my mind. And that's a really interesting choice because I love Gillen and I've always thought that they had a little bit of a punk attitude. Um, you've got, uh, you know, Bernie Torme wears the feathers and these really out there gear and their, their sort of um, live performances were very ramshackle. So out of that, um, those deep purple type of uh, family bands, White Snake Rainbow, they were always the most punky, the most experimental, and the most ramshackle. And, um, yeah. you know, Future Shock, Glory Road, or um, even Double Trouble, um, definitely they had a little bit of a, a punk flavour. But again, if you asked Ian Gillen, he'd just probably go, oh, Definitely not. We're nowhere yeah. near punk. But to me, yeah. just especially with um, Bernie Torme in the band, I think they uh, there was a little bit of punk, um, um, you know, flavour. 
waiver waiver and and he yeah. and he just cuz he's he's maybe a little contrary and he likes to argue he'd probably say we're not part of the new wave of british heavy metal either right yeah so he 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 wouldn't he wouldn't allow for any category and frankly their sound is is pretty admirably non categorizable as well Absolutely. It's just totally out there. And uh, and Bernie Tomei was very uncommercial. Um, he, like, they wanted to go on the top of the pops, and that was when he said, I'm out of the band. I, I think that was, um, and that's when, um, you know, Yannick Gears came in. So, yeah. No, that's a great pick. Uh, something I wouldn't have thought, but no, that, no it's really cool. good. Um, I'm going to go with um, a band that I got into in the uh, late 80s, and this is a the genre of, of skate punk, and they're a crossover between um, punk and metal, and I'm talking about suicidal tendencies. The album I'm going to put up is uh, Join the Army, which is 1987, but the, the breakthrough album for there was their uh, self-titled debut of 1983, which was quite revolutionary. Um, it was a crossover between punk and metal. Um, it was a sort of sound that had a lot of virtuosity where you had guitar solos, bass solos, something that was quite unusual for punk. I mean, if you closed your eyes and you listened to it, you think, oh, wow, this is like speed metal or it's heavy metal, but it was something completely different. The sort of topics they were talking about, like especially their big hit was institutionalised, um, was about, you know, social alienation, pop, uh, was very political. It was all about teenage angst and it really played up to a um, sort of a ready-made audience. And it, it sort of started a genre of music. So you had DRI, you even had um, SOD, that, that sort of humorous band which had a little bit of anthrax in there storm troopers of death in australia there was a band called mass appeal that were quite huge but they it created this whole genre which was emerging between speed metal and um fresh punk you have to say they were probably the godfathers of bands that uh, came out in the 90s like the offspring uh blink 182 and and no i think no fx were right at the start but it created a whole genre and it was a mix between the metal guys liked it and also the punk guys liked it and um it was all melded into this subculture called um skate punk which also had a little bit of skate culture as well yeah. And we didn't we didn't share our lists. And it was an it was a band that I took out some stuff as well. Um, you know, I, I I have more than five and I, I would have been able to mention them. But so, yeah, so this is um, which. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this one here is kind of the the heaviest, uh, the, the most well produced. And this is Peter Collins, I believe. Right. Let me just check. Yeah. Pr produced by Peter Collins. Right. Um, and then uh, Suicidal for Life. And then there's an earlier one there. And, you know. To, to fine tune what you said a little bit, I mean, I've always considered them a, a cross between thrash and American hardcore kind of thing. Um, you know, not 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 leaning particularly towards punk or SoCal punk or anything like that. More like more like this is a hardcore thing and and a and a large uh, sort of Latin uh, Latino uh, you know element to it as well with it with the you know the, the the sort of gang look to the thing and the fact that they're they're from there sort of thing but uh but yeah it was uh it was it was uh, a, a more sort of a carnal street version of thrash and of course robert trujillo uh goes on to be in in metallica from in that metallica. So yeah great great choice um all right my next one you know you could do a whole whole sh uh, show on this band uh the way it sort of fits but i'm, I'm gonna go with frank zappa um, you know, Frank Zappa, definitely uh, completely uncategorizable, um, but I like the way that it fits uh, your, your second, uh, more sophisticated add-on part of this question, which is, which is cross audiences. So, so Frank Zappa's audiences, um, you know, forget about what we're ever going to be able to call Frank Zappa because it is so un uncategorizable, but uh, prog people love them. Uh, goofy teenagers love them for the, uh, for the potty humor. Right. Uh, all the all the big hits are, are, are kind of like like uh, slightly mischievous, dirty songs. Right. So so he had some some definite commercial appeal among, you know, teenage boys and stoners and all that sort of thing. And then jazz people like him as well, because there's there's a lot of jazz that goes on in this band as well. You've got you've got marimbas, um, you know, all, all sorts of like, you know, super long uh 
um, instrumental stuff, you know, full instrumental albums. You've got classical as well. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've never talked to any classical people in my life, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't know how many classical people uh, like him, but I mean, most of them would probably appreciate the fact that he has classical albums as well. He's even got, he's even got, you know, the whole shut up and play your guitar thing where, where you could say he's one of the godfathers of, uh, of the, the guitar shred thing, because, because frankly, you know, one of, one of the godfathers or one of the pillars of that whole thing is Steve Vai and Steve Vai came from his situation as well. So, uh, and then, yeah, all the drummers are always in the drum magazines all the time. So, uh, so yeah, talk about having a, a, a cross audience. Frank Zappa is a, a good textbook version of that. I don't own one Frank Zappa album, but God, where do I start? It's yeah. just so much. It's just like yeah. reading an encyclopedia. But, well, that's uh, funny. I'm, I mean, that's that's a whole uh, that's a whole interesting show. I might I've, I might uh, I've been threatening to do uh, an episode of my History in Five Songs podcast on on uh, when people ask you to recommend where to start on a band and how how weird a question that is. But this is a band where where um, you know there's there's kind of a gateway way of getting into them, like like. The most commercial things he ever did are essentially between about 1979 and 1982. He did just this huge pile of albums and half of them are double albums all within that period. And they're all the shorter songs with lyrics and they're funny and all that stuff. Lots of songs per album. So there's so where do you start almost anything between 79 and 82? Yeah. Well, that's something I'll uh, look into one day when I get time anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the next artist I'm going to put forward is Gary Newman. So um, this is the Tubeway Army. This guy uh, started off in like late 70s, like 78, 79. Um, the big hit off this album was Are Your Friends Electric? And it's um, basically he's got a bit of a, had a bit of an audience, whether it was New Wave post-punk, um, synth pop. He had another uh, follow-up album, The Pleasure Principle, which had a huge hit called Cars. I think it went top five in um, Canada and in the US, all around the world. Had a few more hits in, in America, down in the park, uh, Wear Glass. And then his career sort of tapered off. But then it got resurrected in the 90s where um, guys like Trent Reznor and Nine Hinch Nails were quoting him and saying that we're really influenced by Gary Newman and that sort of sound. And he got a new lease of life, sort of reimagined himself as a um, industrial um, rock artist. I actually saw him about fifteen years ago, and uh, yeah, it was it was totally an industrial type of metal show. So he, he would be playing songs like Cars and Are Your Friends Electric, but nothing like the minimalist. A uh, stripped back version of the Tubeway Army it was very industrial and very much sounding like Nine Inch Nails. So to me, this is a perfect example of somebody who's reinvented himself, but he, you know he's still got that audience that think he was like the the second coming of David Bowie um, in the late seventies. But he's picked up this industrial um, sort of audience um, because you know, just needs somebody with a name like Trent Rensner who has uh, recommended him and, um, you know, he's got a whole lease of life. But um, I'm a huge fan of uh, Gary Newman. I love his minimalist sound, um, his arrangements. Lyrically, he's wonderful, you know, alienate, alienation, um, science fiction. Um, I think those first couple of albums that he put were a, a, or almost near genius. I don't think Bowie liked him very much, but, uh, you know, for a couple of years, his uh, star, you know, shunned very brightly and then, um, yeah, sort of disappeared and, and came back. Yeah, it's a funny one. When we think of the audiences, this is almost like us putting a, a name to audiences that are changing really fast, because maybe in the early days, you'd say, oh, he appeals to new wave people. And then and then mm. very quickly, you'd say, oh, he appeals to post punk people. And then very quickly, things move on. And you say, oh, he, he appeals to the synth pop uh, crowd. Right. Um, you know, the new romantics may be a little bit, although he 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 wasn't he wasn't Mr. Fashion in that way sort of thing. Right. So so it's it, it's almost like, you know, his music um, 
it's it's pretty uncategorizable in that he started that whole thing pretty early, like like an ultravox uh, sort of thing as well, where where, uh, you know, there might have been more traditional instruments early on and then it and then it changes over time. So, yeah, it's it's a hard one to pin an audience from. I have fond memories also of uh, I got to interview him once on person on the tour bus and get a bunch of stuff signed and stuff. He was great. Um, yeah. So that was really cool. But uh, yeah, good choice. Good choice. Um, OK. My next one um, represents another huge debate. I'm going to go with Peter Gabriel um, right. because, uh, you know, here's a situation. I went on Sea of Tranquility once and Pete, Pete and I did our favorite prog albums of all time sort of thing. And almost every one of my choices um, I realized after the fact was uh, was kind of breaking the rules of prog. And, and it's like so the big debate is is. Is Peter Gabriel a, a prog artist? Is he a prog rock artist? Does he appeal to to prog people? I guess uh, if you're more of a prog purist, you're you're going to start to say, "Oh no, I only love him on early Genesis." But as time moves on, does he become a new wave artist? Does he become a a world music artist? Uh, does he become something else? It's it's again very hard to categorize music. It's it's like just very futurist. It's almost like king crimson's uh uh you know evolution over time you know by the time you get to the 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 red blue yellow period it's like wow we don't we don't have a clue how to uh define this music and then a lot of people do bring up that it's it's very new york it's tied in with with talking heads and things like that right um but uh but yeah i i just love the way that uh that um as to, you know, and the first two are much more uh, conservative, but by the time you get to this is the fourth album, and it's certainly the third album. The third album is absolutely ground groundbreaking. The face melt album. Um, it's uh, you know you start to wonder in the back of your mind without you know being able to talk to everybody. You start to wonder how many prog people even like Peter Gabriel anymore. Um, you know, with this with this big you know all this technology and these big world music beats and stuff and what kind of artist is he so uh and then finally he gets to be super super famous and then uh if you want to talk about crossover audiences you know the world the regulars the normies you know love peter gabriel eventually he becomes just this guy that that all of um you know all of anybody who's even a casual music listener or whatever he's selling lots and lots of records with the so album um so at that point, he's just uh, he's just uh, part of uh, the, the regular pop culture fabric for a little while. Yeah, no, that's an interesting case study of somebody whose uh, his artistry has evolved and and become more mainstream. Um, yeah, indeed. And I think he's got a new album this year, hasn't he? Yes, Martin? apparently. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's really bizarre. He's he's releasing like one song on every full moon or something, right? As, as how this is working so he's got i think just two out at this point um and right. then they're just all coming out over time and uh and so there's a lot of crankiness in the peter gabriel community it's like ah oh, come on just give us the whole thing or why are you doing this or is it even an album at the end uh, will it be an album all that kind of thing it's pretty funny though it's uh that so that's kind of the plan the full moon happens and he releases a song so so yeah a gla glacial pace all right yeah, yeah. <laughs> no worries um all right the next one i'm gonna go is maybe it's i'm doing it a bit of an australian perspective but i'm going to talk about acdc so acdc in the 70s were you know, their music would be complementing in the pop charts. So you'd go into a disco tech, you'd go into a club, and their songs would be playing and people would be dancing to it. So it had that sort of um, mass appeal and it wasn't sort of like, to the metal crowd, to the rock crowd, even though they, you know, they enjoyed and listened to ACDC. So, you know, I'm talking about the Bon era, you know, if you want blood, um, my favourite album, ACDC Power Age. Um, I think it was only when, you know, back in black that it started to attract a bit more of a metal crowd. And that may be in a, more of the American, um, Canadian or European experience. But the Australian experience is that, They've just been accepted as um, to the general public in popular culture, whether you like pop music, whether you like rock music, or whether you like hard rock, everyone loves ACDC. It's sort of one of those ones where it's a cross audience. Um, is that a bit more the same in, in America, or was it around that time in Black and Back in Black Martin a bit more sort of genre specific? Well, I'd, I'd say it was a little different. So in the 70s, um, 
you were if you were a metalhead, you loved ACDC. Otherwise, you didn't know about them. So so mm. 70s, it's pretty clear cut. They're part of the metal crowd. So this is the fascinating thing about them. And so as you move on into Back in Black, the metal crowd still like them. And I always thought an interesting thing about ACDC that that helped make the metal that people don't really think about very much is the extremity of the vocal. Uh, more than even the music. I mean, the music is is distortion pedal all the way through, and it's metal, and it's fairly it's fairly heavy for its day. And even back in black, I mean, the whole album is heavy. Um, so I think if you're a metalhead, uh, you're you still like ACDC. So this is one of the great things about ACDC is they're massive. It means a lot of people like them. I, you know, you never hear people really saying we don't like them, right? Mm. Um, so essentially. As, if you're a metalhead, you still kind of always like ACDC. Now we're moving all the way through the 80s and into the into the 90s, early 90s, let's say. Um, but obviously, they're a super famous band, so everybody loves ACDC. Now, when everybody loves ACDC, when when you think of all the uh, all the all the normies and the casual mm. people and the people who don't own a lot of albums or whatever. ACDC becomes one of those bands that it's the one album I own that where I'm walking on the wild side. Right. Yeah, you know, you you own this album. Eventually, you own maybe the Metallica Black album. You might even own a Motorhead album, Ace of Spades, right? So, but the interesting thing about ACDC as time goes on and as metal gets heavier and heavier and heavier, um, then the debate comes with the twenty-year-olds and the thirty-year-olds. Like they've they've long stopped calling ACDC metal. So that's yeah. kind of the interesting thing. And then you get to the difference between heavy metal and metal. Uh, and that kind of thing. So, so uh, yeah, so, so it almost feels like partway through the eighties and, and into the nineties, people stopped calling ACDC heavy metal. Yeah. I think is how it goes. Interesting. Well, yeah, I think yeah. because Australia um, was built, uh, the rock industry was built a lot on the pub rock scene. The pub rock scene, you know, was very healthy in Australia in the seventies and eighties. And, I think um, a lot of people sort of even like Angel City and Rose Tattoo, they were just so much in popular culture and uh, a lot of, you know, normies or people that, you know, love pop music also would have in their collection Rose Tattoo or Angels or, or ACDC. So many people that, you know, I'd come across in life, they say, I don't like hard rock, I don't like heavy metal, but I like ACDC. And, um, mm. yeah, that's why I sort of thought this would be a good candidate just to put as a, a cross-genre band because they sort of appeal to that audience, not specifically hard rock or, or heavy metal. But in I think in the 80s when they had those earlier albums, um, like Flick of the Switch and Fly in the Wall, that's when a lot of the audiences started to drop off and maybe they were a little bit more um, heavy metal specific. Did you sort of notice there was a little bit of a turn around the mid-80s? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It's almost like um, it's almost like when the popularity goes down, what they lose is is the general rock audience, but the metalheads stick with them. I mean, it's not that the albums get any heavier. The flick of the switch is marginally heavier than Back in Black, but for those about to rock, is marginally lighter than Back in Black. And Fly on the Wall is not particularly heavier than anything. And Blow Up Your Video mm -hmm. is just a crappy album, and it's not really heavier or lighter. So, so they kind of stay the course essentially. But yeah, it's an interesting point, like you say. Um, when they lose that massive amount of sales, because it really does drop off. I mean, they're getting basically single platinum albums um, throughout the late, late latter part of the 80s, while, while Back in Black just keeps selling like crazy. And and for those about to rock, I think this sits right now as seven times platinum or something. So so yeah, as as the 80s move on, um, you lose you lose those casual fans that were there because it it rose above you know, the media umbrella into into the mainstream and the metalheads stick around kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Keep the faith. Yeah. All righty. What's your next Okay, one? so my next choice, um, I've got a few honorable mentions here as well, but let's, um, hmm, which one should I go with? Oh, this is an interesting one, I think. Um, Blue Oyster Cult um, is an interesting one because um, essentially the the only audience they had this is a funny one because the only audience they had was the hard rock and heavy metal audience. Yet 
but on the strength of all of the albums, there's so much variety on them and, and so much pop and, you know, two or three quite experimental songs per album. Literally, I mean, most Blue Oyster Cult albums, you could say, ah, there's, th there's three or four heavy songs per album kind of thing. Um, so it's funny that um, they appeal to only one kind of crowd uh, and yet... Uh, the albums are not that heavy and everybody, you know, I, I talk to is always surprised and going, yeah, you know, I play, I play that stuff back and it's not even really all that heavy. But the reason they appeal to the heavy metal crowd is the, the craziness of the name Blue Oyster Cult and the craziness of the concepts and, you know, an album called Cultosaurus Erectus. And they had, they had really flashy, crazy, heavy, heavy metal um, song names. Um, and then also, obviously, they are operating, you know, their, their big period is in the 70s where there's not a lot of heavy stuff anyways. But there's a lot of there's enough heavy stuff to, to say that they're not that much of a heavy metal band. And, you know, we can we can, you know, uh, assign some importance or whatever to when they have a hit with Don't Fear the Reaper, or Burn For You or whatever. But really, they don't you know, th those albums don't don't sail off into the into the three and four times platinum uh, range or anything mm -hmm. like that. So they never really do have a mainstream audience. And then it drops off fairly quickly after that. Um, but yeah, I always I always found that funny. It's like it's like so they never had a mainstream crowd. They never really had pop fans or synth fans, even though they used a lot of synthesizers and, and piano and stuff like that. And they never had that fan base they never really hit it big with the singer songwriter type fans like the really the real musical sophisticate sort of thing um so yeah kind of a funny one heavy metal yeah. crowd not that heavy a band yeah yeah that, that that's a good choice um i think rolling stone or one of those snob presses uh, uh described them as the thinking man's heavy metal band yeah. um and another thing was uh weren't they sort of in sort of like uh, the Patty Smith circles there. Didn't she go out with the keyboardist? They had a, a some sort of connection with the CBGB crowd. I think there was some sort of cross. Yeah, so they're from New York, but yeah, mm. Alan Lanier went out with Patty Smith, and Jim Carroll was yep. buddies with Al Alan Lanier as well, and they wrote some lyrics. And then Richard Meltzer and Sandy Perlman and and all yep. the Michael Moorcock. So there's there's all this literariness to them. And even when Rolling Stone calls them that, it's not like any any snobby rolling stone type singer songwriter fans you know patronize the band uh you know mm. they're they're roughly getting it right with the elevator pitch of calling them that um but even that's wrong right so, so they're not they're not the thinking man's heavy metal band they're the thinking man's band that appeals to heavy metal fans that's not very heavy metal yeah yeah i always thought that was faint praise whatever it was anyway yeah right that's a that's another way of putting it yeah yeah all right. Um, my last real pick is uh, this band, Faith No More. So um, the real thing, they started off at being very punky, um, funk metal, um, but this album was the breakthrough in America. Actually, it was probably the only hit they had in America. They're much bigger in the UK, Europe and Australia, and then they sort of tapered off in, in North America. Um, but I think the... Uh, the audience they bring is definitely the alternative crowd, metal crowd. There's the punk crowd. Um, some people say they invented, you know, they were the origins of that new metal, which is not one of my favourite genres, or, you know, the integration of um, funk metal. Look, the real thing is probably the album that I, I'd like to showcase because, uh, you know, um, Epic, Falling to Pieces, Zombie Eaters, um, it, it just had all different styles of music. You know, on one track it might sound like thrash metal or death. Next um, track it, it sound very much like funk metal. Um just so much variety, and that may have been um, the reason why they didn't break through in a, in America because it was a head scratch. They were on the the lower bill with Guns and Roses and Metallica from memory, um, toured around America. Um, I think when the real thing came out, but I think a lot of people probably got confused. What are they? Are they alternate? Are they punk? Are they heavy metal? Because a lot of uh, Mick Patton is just. He, he is in so many side projects. He has a uh, extreme curiosity for different types of music. And 
Faith No More is, is an example of his curi- musical curiosity because it covers so many different genres. So I think that's a perfect example where you've got a band that you can't really categorise um, where it lands in, in one particular genre because they cross over in so many different varieties. For God's sakes, they were even um, they even covered uh, The Commodore's Easy, which was a uh, top five pop hit in Australia, So, um, which was probably a piss take, but nevertheless they um yeah they just cover the gamut yeah and they and they are part of that strange uh you know genre known as funk metal in the early days i mean when when those when the first albums came out uh first couple with with chuck mosley in the band it was almost like we framed them as a heavier version of red hot chili peppers but they also fit in with the likes of uh more dread uh scatterbrain uh, the the suicidal tendency side project infectious grooves, right? Um, so yeah, they they crossed over in these different ways, and you wonder if the metal crowd there there was there's definitely always been this adversity between metal and rap. Um, so you feel like that some of the metal crowd would have been vehemently against them for for being for being rappy and having the big funk grooves and stuff like that, and as, as well. So yeah, great choice for sure. I got a couple honorable mentions here that I took out. Um, if I could go through, uh, do you want yeah. to go back and forth or uh, oh, I'll, I'll just rattle them all off? Yeah, here. just rattle them off. Uh, okay, yeah. so we got Max Webster, yes. almost the same situation as Blue Oyster Cult. Um, not really loved by the prog set, particularly. They're kind of like loved by the hard rock set and not a very heavy band uh, and loved by Rush fans. They're they're almost like the baby Rush and brought up through the whole Rush thing. But but a cross between uh, poppiness and heaviness and progginess, essentially. Uh, we've got Voivod um who are you know a cross between well they're they're basically considered a harsh version of progressive metal something that rush invented so um but they're basically loved only by the metal crowd but the metal crowd can appreciate progressive metal uh you've got pantera right so this is uh this is kind of like uh inventing their own uh more potent form of thrash um but it's got kind of a hardcore a more hardcore vocal on it so i don't know what you would call it. people say that these guys um in in a, in a little bit of phil's very um heartfelt confessional lyrics are an influence on new metal as well uh and then you've got the great debate that happens between um you know a band like this metal church who it feels like uh, they had one foot in thrash, one foot in traditional American power metal. And, uh, and you know, people say that uh, they didn't do that well because they were caught between these two, uh, you know, solitudes, dualities or whatever. And they tour, they tour with Metallica, but they're not as heavy as Metallica. Uh, although, you know, on, in, on, on those stages, they came off that way. But it is a little more, you know, grinding straightforward. I mean, they're, they're basically a cross between um, early Metallica and Dio. Uh, kind of thing. And then my last one that people can't categorize, I have a hard time categorizing them, King's X, um, which are basically loved by the metal set, um, somewhat by the alternative set, but they're kind of a metal band. You, completely, you, you, can't, you can't put them in any box whatsoever, but it, it's, all, it's all more or less you know, pretty heavy distortion pedal, pretty big booming drums, loved by metal people more than anything. It could be a little doomy, it could be a little grungy, it could be a little Beach Boysy on the vocals. Uh, but uh, you know, I I wouldn't say because they they are as small as they are. You know, they're a large cult band, but they're essentially just loved by the metal set. Yeah, nice, nice. Um, a couple of honourable mentions. Um, the Cult, I've just put their greatest hits, Pure Cult. So they started off um, gothic, alternative, um, and then you had Electric where they had this really stripped-down ACDC sound, and then the follow-up Sonic Temple was, went, you know, was like over the top. It was like Queen, um, Hard Rock, and th- they've gone through s- so many incarnations. But their latest album is like a, a return to the early sound of the cult, which is, um, you know, kind of alternative. Um, one of our favourite bands, uh, The Damned. you got the first album, classic punk, School of 1977. But then, alas, you know, in the early 80s, they did this album, Phantasmagoria, which is like gothic, so and it's pop. So that's just an example of um, a band that, you know, they changed their sound and the imagery and, um, you know, they gained a, maybe double the audience 
maybe lost some of the old school of 77 crowd, but nevertheless, that's an example where you've got a band that uh, appealed to two um, cross genres. Um, another honourable mention, I haven't got the album around, is probably Depeche Mode. They started off as synth pop, but as they evolved from Violator and Songs of Faith and Devotion, um, they definitely went for a harder edge sound, wherever it was rocky and industrial, and um, they've been going down that wheelhouse ever since, um, you know, um, leaving the early sort of synth pop sound well behind. So that's that's another honourable mention. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Martin. It's um, great to have you back on the show in 2023 and um, rattling off those five uh, five bands that, you know, cover a lot of different audiences. Uh, you can see Martin on the Sea of Tranquility and lots of other channels, lots of other things happening. Um, please like and subscribe to Rock Day Dream Nation and, uh, yeah, throw your comments. Tell us what you think and, you know, throw us a couple of other bands that you think would cover this topic of uh, cross genres. And, um, yeah, we'll do a, a show pretty soon. Cheers. Sounds good. See ya. All right.